Thank you, Simon, and uh, good evening, all. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And uh, yeah, it is a long way from Perth, but I'm really pleased to make the journey and, and actually join with you in the New Zealand chapter. You're, you're a very special part of RTSA. We're one of the unusual societies that is joint between Engineers Australia and the IPNs. And uh, it's great to spend some time over here with you as well and see such a, a full house. Although, shame there's uh, no women apart from the one who knows the way to get out of the building <laughs> if we have an emergency. So uh, um, the topic I, I've chosen for myself today is innovation, which is, what is innovation? We could probably debate that for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, so this is, I think, some, some personal thoughts on that, some examples from work that I've been involved in in recent times. And um, I'll try and move through that, I think, reasonably quickly, and maybe we can pro provoke a bit of a, an engaged discussion at the end of it to, uh, just to take some of those topics a little bit further. So um, on the topic of innovation, I thought, well, it's St. Patrick's Day today. I don't know if there's any Irish people in the audience, but uh, uh, 17th of March is an important day for them. And I thought, well, I'm going to go and see if I can find something innovative about being Irish. So you know, I put in innovative Guinness drinking. Into, into Google. I'm not sure why that was the first thing that came to me, but anyway. Um, so I found this. <laughs> this. Straight up, I didn't make this up. There, there is an article on the internet you can go and search for it yourself. Drunk squirrel causes $470 of damage to a bar. Interestingly, it was in Britain. If it had been in Ireland, obviously, I'm sure it wouldn't have caused any trouble. But here it is, drinking its Guinness. Um, so, you know, there's certainly an innovative way to consume Guinness. Um, and a happy St. Patrick's Day, but I think, you know, just to try and weave a little bit of a safety message into that as well. Obviously, come out to these sorts of events, maybe we have a drink or two afterwards. It's always important that we make a wise decision about how we get home. And being in the railway industry, I'm very much hoping we use the train service to, to get home if that goes anywhere near where you live. So a little bit more about, about me and, and the RTSA as well. Um, first of all, me. Uh, not my best image, perhaps, but anyway. So uh, I joined British Rail in 1988 um, with some ridiculous notion at the time that I follow in my father's footsteps of joining a state-owned industry and retire as he did at the age of 52 with a nice healthy payout. He hasn't done a paid day's work for the last 24 years, lucky bugger. And the house is in a very good state of repair. Um, I also thought I was going to have a stable career with a you know, single industry um, in a single country. So. Three years later, I find myself privatised out to, a, to an independent consulting business and ten years later, I came to Australia, or went to Australia, given that we're in New Zealand, for what I thought was going to be a two-year sort of career-broadening working experience to work on a project in Melbourne. Instead, I got a three-week job in Perth that lasted for a year and a half, met my now wife, and uh, it's 15 years later. <laughs> so um, I've actually been really fortunate because um, you know, the, the railway industry is so diverse and so interesting and there's so much to explore that, you know, certainly for me and I, I hope for all of you, um, you've had a, a great career in the industry or you're just embarking on one, depending on where you are. And, and the, this career, this industry just offers such a huge opportunity to continually be learning, expanding and, and being challenged. And, and that, I think that's the journey that I've I've taken. I started off as a rolling stock engineer, initially on maintenance, then on new fleets, rolling stock vehicle procurement, then dealing with interfaces with operations and with infrastructure, and then more broadly into um, you know, business cases for projects and, and putting forward proposals to government about what, to, uh, what sort of rail infrastructure to, to develop. Worked on the, the business case for the light rail system for Perth, which unfortunately didn't get up because of government funding constraints, but most recently I spent six months on a tender design for the project that did get up for it instead of it from a government funding point of view, which is a, a new railway to the airport in Perth, $2 billion of investment, nine kilometres of underground railway, three new stations, goes under both of the runways at Perth Airport, which will remain live and operational whilst the TBMs go underneath. So pretty interesting career progression from somebody who started off uh, repairing electric multiple units so uh, and I, I still see those opportunities going forward and I think that has some some resonance with what RTSA is about as well you know there are uh, a number of specialist bodies within our industry of which IRSE is one of course and really proud to be 
jointly delivering this uh, lecture with the IRSE and that, that reflects the greater collaboration that we're getting with all of our um, professional cousins, PWI, IRSE, RTAA and also the Institution of Rail Operators. Um, and RTSE's, RTSA's role I think in the industry as you would know reasonably well being members is to bring together all of us who are, are professionals in this industry regardless of whether we're engineers or operators or business managers or whatever uh, the, the community of practice for the professional advancement of railways and it is the fact that it's got those opportunities that I described and that I've experienced in my career that, that bring us all together. So that's our role in, in RTSA is to advance the people in the industry, their status and their training and development. <coughs> Turning then to my, my topic, and this is a little bit of a grab bag of innovations. We can debate what an innovation is, like I said, but uh, some things that I think resonate with me and, and I'll, I'll bring them together to a few concluding themes towards the end. So vertical alignment optimization, I guess I'm talking here about new greenfield railways. So uh, a lot of the work I've, not so much in the last few years, as anyone who follows the iron ore industry would know that the iron ore price has declined, but Prior to that, there was a very significant boom in the export of iron ore from the state of Western Australia. It went from something like 150 million tonnes per annum to over 500 million tonnes per annum last year. Um, enormous expansion of construction of new heavy haul railways right up there at the upper, le upper limits of, of technology. You know, 30,000 tonne trains, 40 tonne axle load, um, whole new railways being built of many hundreds of kilometres. The vertical alignment of those railways is absolutely crucial to train performance and to the costs of construction. And just um, looking here on the left hand side at the relative cost of various components of the infrastructure of a heavy haul railway, you can see that there's a, more than half of the cost typically is in earthworks. And one of the drivers for that is the difficulty of getting a good fit between a heavy or railway alignment with its relatively shallow grades and inflexible um, setting of the vertical point of intersection or the changes in vertical alignment with the actual surface of the earth and of course the closer fit you can get to natural surface the lower your earthworks and the more likely it is you're going to get a cut to fill balance which is relatively close in terms of the, the proximity of moving earth around for construction. So what we did is we, we took the rule of thumb, which in this instance was no more than one change of grade underneath a train at any time. And when your train is three kilometers long, that doesn't give you very many options for placing your VPI along your alignment. So we said, does that really need to be the case? And we used in-train force modeling to allow us to explore this. So what we did is we took the advances in computational analysis to look at in real time, in, in computational real time at least, the, the forces actually being generated in the coupler interface between all of the wagons in the train and the locomotives as the traction load is applied, the braking loads applied. And obviously you've got limit forces in there which are the yield forces of those various components of the coupling system. And rather than just taking this rule of thumb that one change of grade will protect the in-train forces, actually look at the limit case for the various components in the system and design an infrastructure that keeps the in-train force within the yield limit but maximises the fit of the alignment to surface. And what we found is you can do considerably better than the rule of thumb. So we applied this on a new railway that was constructed to the Carrara mine in, in Western Australia. 90 kilometres of greenfield construction plus 200 kilometres of line upgrade on an existing narrow gauge line in the Midwest which was built in the 1890s. In fact, I don't know if any of you have heard of a guy called C.Y. O'Connor. Yeah, but um, just as a little aside, legendary figure in Western Australian history, um, basically engineered all the railways, engineered the port of Fremantle, a bit like Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and also was the architect of the water pipeline to Kalgoorlie which enabled the, the eastern gold fields to be opened up. 
unfortunately for him he, he took a hell of a lot of uh, vitriolic um, attacks in the press and he actually committed suicide two weeks or, or very shortly in fact before that that pipeline to Kalgoorlie was opened but when we went and looked at this railway we dug out the original roll plans from the the railway archive basement with CY Connor's original ink pen signature on them looking back at those those original alignments that we then optimized in various places using this approach got this saving here as a result of applying computational analysis techniques to, to overcome that, that rule of thumb approach. So another one, this is uh, a bit more current, this is, this is happening right now, this is a project we're doing in, in Perth, um, the government's building a new 60,000 seat sporting stadium on uh, the Burswood Peninsula which is here, the stadium's going to go about there the centre of Perth, just off that, that image there, to the left. So, significant stadium investments, about 800 million itself, and alongside it, uh, it's in a difficult place to get to by road here, although this is a freeway, there's very little space for car parking. So the, the entire strategy for this stadium is based on moving <coughs> more than 50% of a maximum game day attendance by public transport within one hour of the finish of the game. So for rail, that means 28,000 people have got to leave this spot in an hour. And about 90% of them are heading left on that picture because there's only one line goes to the right, so all the other part of the network, the north, the west, and the south of Perth, all requires you to head back into the city first. What that means is we're going to build a six-platform station which can dispatch trains at 90-second intervals that are coming out of a stowage facility that's got 117 rail cars of capacity so you can absolutely flood the system in a unidirectional fashion after a game. Um, $110 million project. Drainage for that was uh, a major challenge and the, the reference design that had a pit and pipe system, what we've done here is used uh, an infiltration drainage system or an eco-crate you might have heard it called. So this is a, a void installed in this case in the center of the alignment it fills up with water when it rains and then it infiltrates and drains away into the sandy soils of Perth obviously it depends on the soils that you're dealing with but in Perth it's uh, you know it's a, it's a very convenient soil arrangement to be able to to use this type of a technique but it hasn't previously been applied for the public transport authority and in fact they were very circumspect about adopting this technology has been used in Sydney and there was a, a rather infamous failure of, of an infiltration drainage system in a, in a rail station car park which they were well aware of. Um, so they gave us the third degree <laughs> in, in validating this technique um, which I'm pleased to say the project team were able to come through with flying colours and in fact they recently won an award from the Stormwater Association. Uh, so they were WA uh, winners and they've gone forward to the national awards um, for innovative delivery of stormwater solutions. So that's one example from that project. This is another one. This is the uh, main concourse for the, pa the patrons. They come out from the stadium and then go across to the various platforms. The reference design had that in concrete. Very significant mass needed, um, very high capacity cranes to lift it in position. Uh, the innovation, and this is where I, you know, you've got to be careful about using the word innovation. The innovation here is using steel instead of <coughs> concrete. Mm, yes, that's not entirely innovative, is it? Um, but I would argue it still is. But it, I think what that's, one of the things that really strikes home for me is the context. It, it, it's all context specific as to whether something is innovative or not. You know, my innovation might be passe to you and vice versa. Um, the innovation, if, if you will, is changing the construction methodology for the project, not the material one versus the other. What this allowed us to do on this site is use a tower crane instead of a crawler crane, um, improve the site safety logistics, reduce the construction time frame, change the cost profile of the job. It was one of the things that was influential in being successful in, in winning that project. Again, a lot of circumspect uh, engineers on the client side as to Okay, everyone knows you can make a deck out of steel, but does it have the fire performance? Does it have the durability? 
Uh, can you design it to the required standard in the time available for the project? So the innovation there is about getting it through in quick enough time. Come on in. So, um, digital engineering. A lot of people talk about BIM. I guess digital engineering, what's that? For me, it's, it's sort of BIM plus, if you will, BIM on steroids. Um, this is again from, from that stadium rail project. Um, so there's a thing in this project called the digital work pack, which is the the tool, the information that the construction gang take out onto the work site every day. They don't get any paper, they don't have any plans, there's no, there's no role plans on a desk anywhere in that project office. You get a tablet, it's got a work pack on, there's 150 odd on the job, it's got all this information in it. It's got your safety plans, it's got your design, it's got your, your method statements. It's got your programming logistics, it's got your time allocation, your resource allocation. And it's got access to all of this building information in it as well. It's a real front end loaded process this. Um, you've got to put all this together to get it into a digital work platform to be able to go out on site. Well, I think we all know with projects if you invest up the front in, about, in planning the project and having the information worked through and having gone through the process of, of determining whether it's going to be successful before you go to site, you actually overcome a lot of problems that would otherwise be revealed in construction. <coughs> and they talk in, in the project team about building the project twice, once virtually, once for real. And, and that's what's going on to prepare this. It's also a fantastic collaboration tool before people go out and do their work. So this is an example from an oil and gas project uh, this is a team on the Wheatstone project in, in northern Western Australia. Getting together around the information in the digital work pack at the start of work, you can see the roles that they've got on the project, engineers, trades, supervisory, all around the table discussing the work. You know, can, we, can we all work in the way that the work pack is suggesting? Is it achievable on site? This project had a fantastic record in terms of avoidance of rework. Uh, I think their, their total rework budget on a $15 billion project was measured in tens of thousands of dollars because they invested the time up front in making sure it would fit together before they got on site. So it really does have huge benefits in terms of collaboration and that is a very, very powerful innovation. There's a, there's a learning curve to get up there to really be able to implement it, but when you do, there's a huge reward to be had. So this is another one. This is probably a bit more of a, a left field brainchild. I don't know if anyone's seen this. So this is something that was published by a company called Mineral Resources about 18 months ago. So the problem that they've got is they've got a small iron ore mine in Western Australia in terms. They've only got 30 million tonnes a year that they want to move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I told you it was context specific. <laughs> so, and they are... 350 kilometres away from port and anyone who knows anything about iron ore railways in the Pilbara will know that none of them will let each other on their infrastructure on pain of death. So you'll find that in places there's three corridors parallel with each other, all single track railways, all working, running at maximum capacity moving 150 odd million tonnes each. You could do the whole task with a twin track railway with capacity to spare if they were prepared to talk to each other but they're not. So they came up with this as a, I, I think it's probably not much more than a thought bubble when you inspect it. So I'm not trying to tear this apart from an engineering point of view. I really just want to illustrate the idea of innovation. So they, they're talking about an autonomous vehicle with relatively low axle load, low payload for the, the wagons, distributed power. So there's a motor on each of these wagons. This is just a power supply unit with an electric cable down the thing. They decided that my fit to the surface problem with the uh, vertical intersection spacing and like here's a different solution they came up with we'll stick it all on stilts and take it above the surface so we don't need to deal with the earthworks probably didn't get that one quite right but anyway that was the idea i like the way they're thinking perhaps 
And they said, here's a way that we can potentially reduce the cost of providing rail infrastructure for this task to move this 30 million tons. Maybe they're on the right track, but haven't quite nailed it. And I'm not sure I have either. But here's some thoughts that I had in connection with it. This is a thing called the cargo sprinter that was trialed in Australia about 10 years or so ago. It's a little bit like that vehicle we just saw on the preceding slide. This is a diesel power pack um, cab at each end, basically uh, a couple of container wagons with a cab and an installed power unit. The idea being a lower cost footprint to provide the freight transport. Here's a trailable switch, a particularly bad photograph of one. Here's the Google autonomous car, we've probably all heard about that. Here's a light rail vehicle. What have they got to do with one another? Well, if we can operate more like a light rail in terms of cost of infrastructure, fit to surface, you know, lower capital of asset, the problem we get normally with a heavy haul railway is you end up with lots of trains having to move around because the carrying capacity of any given train is much smaller. So you end up with a far more intense train movement, which isn't possible on a single track. And when you move to a double track, obviously your costs go through the roof. So could we use something like trailable switches so we haven't got the, the point infrastructure out there, autonomous vehicle technologies, GPS, the kind of technology that's there in road vehicles to avoid collisions, so that autonomous trains, a bit like the one on the preceding picture, can cross each other at locations like this in the middle of whoop whoop without hitting each other. Fit to surface so that we have an infrastructure that looks not much too different to this. No big earthworks, no big cuts, no big fills. Um, a bit like the Alistair Darwin Railway, which is built on a shoestring. There's how many kilometers on that? 1,200 kilometers? 1,400 1400 1, 1, kilometers for 1.2 billion, which is a bit different to the sort of five or six, five, eight million per kilometer that you get in the Pilbara for typical Pilbara construction. So change the cost front print in the job. Just reimagine the solution. So that's why I think they're onto something here. I don't think any of us are quite fine what it looks like. But that, I think, is really moving towards true innovation. And I think the prize is probably in integrating disparate technologies from different places, not just staying inside the bubble of rail engineering. You know, sometimes we can be a bit guilty of staying in our bubbles of you know, rolling stock engineering or whatever, but not even just rail. Let's get, I mean, maybe there's more out of here. Maybe there's something from aviation. Maybe there's something from, I don't know, something I've never even thought of that we can integrate together, stir in the soup, and find something that's really going to solve the problem. So I guess just to draw those threads together, I think the common theme through all of these is convention breaking, first principles approach. Don't accept rules of thumb. Go back to the, the root engineering and use the power of modern computational solutions to reevaluate things because oftentimes you'll find there's a rule of thumb equation that was developed by somebody with a slide rule 50 years ago that was the best fit solution at the time but we can fit a lot closer now with modern computing power and that goes to this as well find those pockets of conservatism and be ruthless in ripping them out you have to be able to justify it so you've got to have a robust process of validation. It's got to stand up to inquiry from the client or from any regulatory authority. It's got to be integrated to look at the whole system-wide impacts. And like I say, that's not just rail. Value engineering is the process that brings that together and context-specific, you know, like I've illustrated, I think, um, one man's innovation is another man's passe and vice versa. Thank you. Um, we've got some time for some questions, but before we do, I, I show you that um, the Stadium Rail project that Graham talked about will actually be something for an RTSA presentation here in the beginning of June. We'll have the project direct from the from Transport Authority in Perth. Uh, we'll be visiting New Zealand at the time doing so. If you're interested in finding out more about that project, come along in June. But um, time for some questions? Something burning with all of that. Yeah. Graham, um, how, do you, um, how do you sort of see the role of um, generalists and specialists contributing to, to innovation? I think probably arguably they could both contribute. Um, have you found any principles of working together um, 
from some different ends of that spectrum? I think it, they're the same, I think, for me as the, the, the principles of any effective collaboration and teamwork. I think you've got to, you need diversity and you need mutual respect. Um, and, and people need to enter the room with an open mind to, to challenge the, you know, the accepted position. And the more diversity you've got in the room, um, the more likely you are to be able to explore new avenues. But you do need the, the deep specialist understanding of a topic as well to make sure you don't go down a blind alley. So I think there's a role for both generalists and specialists in this. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Just um, talking about the Stadium Rail project, I did try not to reveal the whole story there. Th there is a lot more to that. I would strongly encourage you all to, to come along to that presentation um, to really get inside what the digital engineering is doing there and, and see some of the animations for that project that, that it was able to deliver. Um, it, you'll, you'll really enjoy it. That um, one shows the Tilbra sitting on the stilts. Yeah. Where, where's that at now? Is it, um, it like my <laughs> idea or is it? <laughs> well, there's another image that I should probably have brought it along, but it, it's, it's come to ground now. <laughs> 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 so they, they've got another image with the same kind of vehicle sitting on the surface. Um, so, uh, yeah, they've, they've realised that, you know, putting 350 k's of infrastructure on stilts probably isn't cheaper than putting it on the surface. And at the end of the day, the force has got to be transmitted into the earth in some even distribution. If you put it through relatively isolated points like they are doing there, then the foundation structures you've got to build are, are going to be reasonably significant. So common sense is entering the room in respect to that. The other thing is that in the last few years, I've, I've lost track of what Rio Tinto are up to, but have they, have they got their um, autonomous trains running? Uh, it depends what you mean by run. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> well, so it, it would be like the forerunner of that. Are yeah. they proving the concept? The, the concept's proven. Um, and if I, I, I was on an autonomous train with Rio Tinto in 2008. Yeah. So actually driving the train, to be honest, is pretty straightforward. It's the system interface with the external environment and with track maintenance workers and other personnel on or about the railway and with people who are you know, crossing the rail at level crossings or communities nearby and what happens when you have a breakdown that's three hours away from the nearest road access point. Those are the real challenges with implementing automation, not with the actual automation of the train. So um, I understand that project's facing you know, it's working through those challenges. I think they've probably found it's that not there yet, it's not there yet. Auto Hall's not fully rolled out and, and running. Uh, it's r and it, as a project, it's, I think, occurring more slowly than Rio had in mind. But yeah, it, it really isn't the automation of the train that's the difficult bit. Yeah. So I'll go here first. Uh, with the in train forces that you talked about earlier yeah. in, the, in the modeling, um, presumably you can actually validate it until you've actually created it. So what, what are all the different ways of verifying this? Is it one field of getting it wrong? What are models fine? Yeah. But it's actually not the right thing to model. So, so how do you verify it? Yes. So we, we, worked with a, we worked with Central Queensland University on that and they've been fortunate enough to have a long running association with Queensland Rail as was Horizon as now is in developing an in-train force modelling and being able to verify it through real data collected off actual trains, distributed power trains in their coal operation. So they have been able through a long period over more than 10 years to validate that the model is an accurate representation of the of the couple of force behaviour. And, and it has been validated over the same yeah. number? Of yeah, validated trains. over the, the alignment that they're operating. Yeah. Graham, um, the, the first talk, the vertical alignment optimization, yeah. as well as reducing the cost of um, construction, was it able to reduce future operating costs, in particular fuel use? Or um, I think you can look at you can look at driving strategies through a similar approach, an approach that optimizes for lowest construction cost might actually have a slightly negative effect on on operating cost 
Um, but with most alignments, you know, your ability to flex your high and low point is not much. You're really just you're dealing with the detail of your alignment, not the not the height differential between start or finish or where your summit is. So um, the fundamentals of the energy consumption are really set by the topography you're running through. But there are strategies that, that do optimise the train driving characteristic um, using a similar approach. One more question. Yeah, I was just interested to the extent that the experience of automation of uh, uh, rapid transit systems, which is quite commonplace mm. around the world, uh, can actually be applied to heavy haul railways. Are there learnings that can go from one to the other, or is it a completely different war game? I think, you know, when I first got to, to WA, I'll answer this in a roundabout way perhaps, but you know, when I first started working on heavy haul railways, everyone was like, oh, the mystique, it's a special thing. You know, everything you've learned in railways isn't applicable. You know, you need to learn the heavy haul, a heavy haul handshake. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, not to, there are, there are fundamentally important differences, but actually, the underpinning engineering and approach to the problem is very much transferable from other types of rail. It's like any rail context. The New Zealand context is different from the Australian one. The Australian one is different from the European one. It's about understanding the, the local factors. And, and they, there are some unique things about heavy haul rail, but they're not things that a railway engineer can't understand. So I, I think, yes, there are technologies from light rail that can be applied. I think the biggest challenge often in the heavy haul or in any space is the difference between brownfield and greenfield. I mean, there's a lot of installed infrastructure and capacity in the, in the Pilbara now. If you're Rio Tinto or BHP, you haven't got any ability to go and really look and be too wild in what you do because you need to have system commonality with what you've got. And, and they're actually locked in with some decisions taken in the 1960s about tipler sizes or getting second-hand wagons from another project that just happened to have them spare at the time that actually govern their system characteristics. When we get into greenfield operations like mineral resources are talking about, or some of these other places where you know, the field is more open, then you can bring in technology developments up to the current day and, and look to places like light rail and, and autonomous vehicles and, and really draw those in. Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, well, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, <coughs> very uh, thought-provoking.